John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not be lost, but have eternal life. You know, I especially love the verse that comes next. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn us, but to save us through Him. You know, there's been a lot of things in my life that I've felt condemned for, but God has rescued me from every single one of them. Is there anything in your life you need to be rescued from? Anything in your life you need to be saved from? Let's fasten our seatbelts. Ready to go? The message of John. Good morning, everybody. Great to have you here. We're in the message of John, the Gospel of John. It's written by the beloved disciple, the one that Jesus loved. It doesn't mean that he loved him more than any of us, but it means that we can all have a beloved disciple relationship with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Every one of us can be called the beloved disciple. And, you know, really this message is about how to overcome disappointment. And it's really the pathway of how you can be the beloved disciple. But you have to learn to look past your disappointment to something greater. You know, the text, uh, by the way, we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture today. And uh, you can follow along your smartphone. You can grab a Bible in the back if you want to. Um, but notice the text says that he, Jesus loved Martha and Mary very much. And, and you might recall that this is the same Mary in Luke chapter 7. We looked at a couple of weeks ago about how to, how to overcome anxiety. Um, this is the same Mary that came in when Jesus was at the home of the Pharisee, the religious leader, who really didn't love very much. And we talked about how the person who's been forgiven much loves much. That we all need to learn to have a great sense of thankfulness for the grace of God. And... And she came in and poured expensive ointment on his feet and washed her uh, feet with her tears and her hair. And then the Pharisee said, you know, if Jesus really, he was thinking to himself, you know, if Jesus really knew the kind of woman that was touching him, you know. And then Jesus interrupted. And he tells this story about how two people owed somebody, one owed him 5,000, one owed, owed 500. And the, and the guy forgave both their debts. And he said, which one do you think will be the most grateful? He said, I guess the one that owed 5,000, who owed the most. He said, that's right. And he talked about how this woman appreciates the grace of God and how really, Simon, the Pharisee, you don't appreciate the grace of God. For one thing, you don't really think you need the grace of God because you think you're better than everybody else. This was the same Mary that did that. This is also the same Martha and Mary that we read about. Some of you have heard before um, where Jesus is at their home. So Jesus would hang out at, this, at Lazarus and Martha and Mary's home frequently. And, uh, you know, again, he loves all of us, but he had this relationship with them. And so he would eat there. And Martha's in there fixing dinner, and Mary's just sitting at Jesus' feet, hanging on his every word. And that's the story, you know, where Martha comes in and says, you know, aren't you going to tell my sister to get in and help me? And then Jesus says to Martha, 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 you're so anxious about many things. But Mary has chosen the one thing that's the most important. And it will not be taken from her. So I want to remind you of this, that Jesus had this relationship with them. He loved them very much. Just like he loves you very much. And he feels what you're going through. The Bible says that we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The people in the Old Testament would come to the high priest and confess their sins and ask the high priest to offer a sacrifice on their behalf. And it tells us in Hebrews that Jesus is now our high priest. We don't need someone that we have to go to. It's great that we have Christian community. We, we get healing as we share things with each other. And we confess our weaknesses and our sins. The Bible says that we're, there's a healing that can happen as we are real with each other. Um, but Jesus is now the one that we go to. And so it's important that we realize as we look at this story that every time that we come to Jesus, he is empathetic to what we're going through. He doesn't say, why don't you get over it? He gets it. And then I love the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. So all that is a background I want you to get. 
so that you know the kind of Savior that you have in your life through Jesus Christ. So that you know that you have a friend who sticks closer than anyone else. So that you know that he feels your pain. He understands your weaknesses. He himself was tempted and tested in every way like we are, yet without sin. But what is the purpose of our disappointments? What is the purpose of our pain? What is the purpose of the difficulties that we go through? What is the purpose of the delays that we go through? Can you imagine when they sent word to Jesus? You know, this Jesus that loves us very much. This Jesus that eats in our home. This Jesus where we have shared so many memories and conversations together throughout his past three years of public ministry. He's only two miles away. And I can imagine, you know, Mary would be the one who would be looking for him first. And I can imagine not too shortly after, maybe a couple hours, she was thinking, well, surely, you know, he'll be here for dinner in time to pray for Lazarus. No Jesus shows up. And she goes to bed a little troubled and a little discouraged, and she gets up first thing in the morning for her early morning prayer, and she goes looking again and says, surely Jesus will be here this morning. But Jesus doesn't show up. And the whole day passed, and the evening comes, and no Jesus shows up. We understand how when Jesus did show up four days later, that Mary would not come out to see him. Martha came out to see him. How do you handle your disappointment and your pain? How do you handle your delays? You know, it's when your faith is challenged the most. It's when your faith is challenged the most that you can grow the most. It's when you can make the most progress. But it's often when, you know, it's when during those times our prayer life is challenged, our spirituality is challenged, our obedience to God is challenged. And that's when we need to step up our game the most. Because guess, guess what we're going to get? We're going to see his glory. See, Jesus tells us that the purpose of disappointment, the purpose of delay, he tells us this in verse 4 and verse 40. In verse 4, it says, when he first got word, he turned to his disciples and he says, this sickness is not unto death. Everybody say, this, this thing I'm going through in my life is not unto death. But I'll see the glory of God. So that's what he said. He said to his disciples, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God that the Son of God will be glorified through it. You know, it's to make Jesus look good. It's to elevate him in my life. You know, I must decrease, but he must increase. And that's what's going to happen as I continue to persevere, as I continue. You know, I don't feel like praying, but I'm going to keep praying. I don't feel like going to church today, but I'm going to go to church. I don't feel like going to my small group, but I'm going to go to my small group. I don't feel like continuing to give, but I'm going to give. I don't, I don't feel like obeying, but I'm going to keep obeying. Because your faith is not a feeling. Your faith is built on the character and the trust of Jesus Christ. He was who he said he was. He was not a counterfeit. And even though we are faithless, the Bible says that he will be faithful. So that's the purpose. It's for the glory of God. It's so that God will do something even more amazing in your life. How many people have seen God just let me have a show of hands because I know some of you are investigating faith. Some of you are like struggling. And some of you are trying to figure out what does it mean to even know Jesus. So don't feel like if you don't have something, okay? But those of you that have felt like you've had God do an amazing thing in your life, raise your hand. Look at that. Look at the witness of that. And so every time we go through something, we need to remember what God did. We need stones of remembrance. We need to recall and we need to enter into thanksgiving and say, God, I want to thank you that you helped me in that situation. I want to thank you that you showed up in an amazing way. I've been thinking about what, is it, what does it mean to see God's glory. I think what it means to see God, God's glory is that we see God do an amazing thing in our life. But it's also that we have an amazing sense of his presence. It's both and. It's not either or. It's both and. And often it's the second one 
that God is wanting us to enter into first. And then we'll get the first one. Does that make sense? Like how desperate are you for God to intervene in that thing that you're praying for? Remember that we looked a couple of weeks ago and Jesus said to the people, you know, you're only hanging out with me for the bread. And what if your son, if some of you that are parents, some of, one, of your, one of your kids came up to you and, and you, know, you could tell it's really about the bread. And it's not about you. What if you had a friend in your life and, you know, it's about this thing, your means. And you begin to figure out they're hanging out with you because of what you have. Not for who you are. It ain't about the money. It's about the glory. Everybody say it ain't about the money. It's about the glory. So I was trying to come up with a meme for this message. That's the one I came up with. My wife was like, you're not supposed to say ant or ain't. I, I like the way it sounds. It ain't about the money. It's about the glory. And here's what that means. Money represents that thing that I want to see God do. Money represents that desperation that I have in my life. God, are you going to recorrect the LG&E bill that was $4,300 this week? I mean, it's never been $4,300. Yes, they did recorrect it to $3,100. That's what it was supposed to be. Lord, are you going to come fix the door on Tuesday night so that the LG&E people can get in so they can read the meter because that's why they couldn't get in last week because the code was broken last week. God, are you going to restore $4,500 to our account for someone who counterfeited a check out of our account this past week? Are you going to credit that because we don't have $4,500 to float for July 1st? Can I get an Amen. But you know what? When Wednesday I found out that someone had counterfeited a check out of our account for $4,500. And then the next day came and somebody contacted me and said, Hey, do you want to, you can borrow $4,500 and I'll put it in. I didn't even respond. You know why? Because I wasn't anxious. And so, uh, so Thursday afternoon, my wife and I, we just kind of took the afternoon off and went and did something fun. And the last I heard from PNC that they hadn't put it back in our account yet, but I wasn't worried. Because I know I'm going to see his glory. And the next day I checked our account and there it was, and guess when it had been put in? The day before. Didn't I tell you if you only believe, you'll see my glory. See, belief starts with a thought, but belief is an action. It's pistuo, the Greek word pistuo. It means to act upon. See, that's why James says faith without works is dead. You act as though it's true. You feel your way into the action by declaration, by saying it, and by thanking God that you're going to come through. And this is why the Word of God is so powerful. This is why so many of the verses that we're going to look at. See, it ain't about the money, it's about the glory. Not only does God want to do an amazing thing, but God wants it to have a, an amazing sense of his presence. The Bible says in Romans that the kingdom of God, Romans chapter 14 verse 17 says this, that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. Am I going to be about, is the glory going to be about the stuff? Is the glory going to be about my task list of things that I want to check off that I'm praying about? And let me tell you something, be very clear. The Lord is not against meeting those things in your life. But if that's what I'm, is that what I'm going to be about? See, this is the test. Am I going to get anxious when it does happen? Or am I going to have an amazing sense of focus on his presence and what he's going to do? See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. I mean, how can it be faith if you've already got it? The ten lepers came to Jesus, and he healed them all, and only one came back to thank him. And Jesus was amazed. Did I not, did I not heal ten? Where are the other nine? That's because the other nine moved on to the next thing. It ain't about the money. It's about the glory. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 when he's talking about anxiety. 
And he's telling us not to be anxious about what we're going to wear, we're going to put on, and about our needs, and how this is going to work out, and how, the, how, the, you know, how this is going to be credited back to our account, and how am I going to get this out. You know, I mean, all that can drive us crazy. And he says this, I love it. He says, people that don't know God, they get so anxious about that stuff. And your heavenly Father knows. I want you to hear this. I want you to think about the things that you're anxious about. I want you to think about the things that you're hoping for. I want you to think about the things that you're praying for. And I want you to hear this, that Jesus is saying this to you over your life. And your heavenly Father knows that you need so many of those things. And he will give you those things if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Is it about God doing something amazing or is it about an amazing experience of his presence? I found, I found these, um, you know, this passage, I looked up glory, you know, through the whole Bible. I just Google searched, or not Google searched, went to BibleGateway.com, put in the word glory. And um, this is Jud Judges chapter 13. Let me just read it to you. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless. Hey, I'm Zorah. I'm, no, I'm, I'm Manoah from the Zorah from the Danites. Uh -huh. Don't you glad you ha don't have all that kind of background these days? Um, people will try to figure you out. What's up, man? I'm a Zor. I'm Manoah of Zora from the Danites. <laughs> And he's got a wife who's childless, unable to give birth. And the angel of the Lord appeared to, to, to her, to his wife, and said, You are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. My wife and I know what that is to be anxious because our daughter Hope, who is, who's going to be delivering her baby any moment, it took four and a half years for Marcia to become pregnant with Hope. And then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me and he looked like an angel of God. I mean, very awesome, she says. And I didn't ask him where he came from and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, you will become pregnant and have a son. And then uh, verse 8, then Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I beg you. You know, it's kind of like, Lord, I, I know I'm, I'm trying to believe here, but help me out and don't get upset at me. I mean, we're so hard on ourselves, aren't we? When God wants to be so full of grace toward us. He said, Lord, I beg you, let, let the man of God you sent to us come again. And, and teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. And then God heard Manoah. And the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her. Go figure, right? The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here. The man who answered me the other day. And Manoah got up, followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? And the angel of the Lord answered, your wife must do all that I've told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or any other fermented drink, or eat anything unclean. She must do everything I've commanded her. And of course, she would be give birth to Samson. If you know, if you've heard the name Samson. The angel of the Lord replied, even though, uh, no, then Manoah said, would you, we would like for you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering and offer it to the Lord... Manoah did realize then it was the angel of the Lord. Many people believe that that is Jesus himself in the Old Testament. And then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name, so that we may honor you when your word comes true. And he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. And then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. 
As the flames blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. And seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. And Manoah realized it was the angel of the Lord. So what was it about? What was the most amazing thing? The amazing gift that they were going to have a son? Or the amazing experience of the angel of the Lord and the amazing experience of his presence. In Matthew 17, it says that Jesus took Peter, James, and John. They went to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there his countenance was changed and, it, and his, his, it, he shone like the sun. His, his, his clothing became bright white. And then it says that Elijah and Moses appeared. And they were talking and the disciples were like amazed at this experience. And then all of a sudden a cloud hovered over and a voice thundered from the cloud. This is my dearly son, the beloved son that I love. Listen to him. And it says the disciples, Peter, James, and John, fell with, with their faces to the ground in fear and trembling. And all of a sudden Jesus touched them and lifted them up and said, don't be afraid. And when they came to their senses, it was just the, Jesus standing there. Is it about the gift or is it about the giver? Is it about the present or is it about his presence that I'm praying for? Jesus said in John 17, the prayer that he prayed, he said, Father, I want all those that you've given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory. When you're going through disappointment, it's not that God's against the thing that you're praying for, that he wants to do an amazing thing, and he will. But he wants you to have an amazing pursuit of his presence. He wants you to have an amazing experience of his presence. And he's not a respecter of persons. He'll show up for anybody who seeks him. And you know, it's keeping in perspective. Instead of being like the crowd, you know, one group said this, see how much he loves him. When he wept. But then the other crowd was saying, you know, well, they're negative. I mean, he, he opened the eyes of the blind. Surely he could come and hear, La hear Lazarus. You know, we go through stuff in life, you know. Surely God could help me. You know, God, where are you? But how about I have a different perspective? Like Paul. Who says that. That the present sufferings of this life cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. See, here's the truth. We start with glory and we end with glory. Nothing is more glorious than the birth of a little baby. When I hold my, daughter, my daughter's daughter, which is going to be a daughter, and I held my son's daughter, Colette, in January, nothing was more glorious Nothing is more beautiful. It says that we were born in the image and the likeness of God. We start with the glory of God and we end with the glory of God. But if I make it about the stuff, I'm going to miss the glory of God. But if I make it about the glory of his presence, I'll get him and I'll also get everything that he has for me as well. And I won't be anxious. Lift up your heads that the king of glory may come in. So when you're going through something, instead of like looking down at it and focusing on it, I lift up my head and I say, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't know why you've delayed. I don't know why you didn't show up. But I'm going to praise you. And I'm going to believe. And I'm going to act as though you're glorious. Because you are. Pick something right now that is the most difficult thing you're going through. The most difficult thing that you're stressed out about. The most difficult thing that you get anxious about. The most difficult thing of what you're hoping God will do. Can you identify it? When you have it, let me know you have it. Just say it, I've got it. You know what the purpose is? is that you'll see God's glory. He will not let you down. 
And what that means is, what John Piper says is that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Let me say it again. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Psalm 63, the psalmist says this, you, you, you God, and let, me, let me just tell you real quick because I know I'm out of time. This is a psalm of David when he was running from King Saul in the desert. And evidently, there wasn't much water to drink. I mean, evidently, that's something to get anxious about. But listen to this. You God are my God, earnestly I seek you. My, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in this dry and parched land where there is no water. But I'm not focusing on the water. I'm focusing on the Savior. I have seen you in the sanctuary and I've beheld your power and your glory. I know what that's about. For to you is the kingdom and the power and the glory. I've beheld your power and glory and because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Even though there ain't much water to drink. I know it's not easy, but God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him like that. He will never let you down. Never. But will you believe? I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied with the riches of foods. On my bed I remember you, and I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you, my right hand, your right hand upholds me. Those who seek my life will be destroyed, but the king will rejoice in God. And I will glory in him. You know, um, and this is an amazing slide. Let's go to the very last slide. Don't measure the love of God for you by how much wealth or how much health, wealth, and comfort he brings into your life. Measure God's love for you by how much of himself he shows you and how much of himself he gives you to know and enjoy. Now let me tell you something that's also amazing. It's each of you. And the way that God is at work in so many of your lives. Because through the stories of how God is at work in our lives, we see the glory of God. We see God do, we, 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 get, we, we get uplifted. Just like someone shared to the guys group Wednesday night. Of how much this church means to him. And how much, how much I mean to him. Stu said that. He didn't have to say that. And I was sitting there praying and I said, hey guys, I want you to pray for me that I'll see, I'm praying that I'll have a greater sense of seeing God's glory this week. As soon as he said that, I looked at him and I said, you know what, I just saw God's glory by what you said. So I wonder if we might get a few closing comments of God's glory about how he's been at work in your life. Like a one minute testimony, it's because you go more than one minute, we're going to cut you off. No, <laughs> One minute commercial. How has God shown up in your life in some way that's been amazing? And maybe it's been more of an amazing sense of his presence. But it's been, it can be an amazing sense of his intervention because we have an amazing God. Amen? Amen.